It's so good to be here today. I think it's really great that Donna's decided and, and the lymphoma organisation has decided to include sexuality in these discussions. I think, like you said, it is a topic that we often neglect. There's so much going on with a diagnosis of cancer and survivorship concerns that afterwards it, it's something gets pushed by the wayside. And I was actually thinking before when we were listening to the sleep talk about how, how linked it is actually with sleep as well. We think about sexual intimacy and how that can actually aid our sleep. But I was also thinking about how as somebody has a cancer diagnosis and, and suffers from fatigue and, and late effects, how people might actually move into separate beds. That might be a way that people uh, cope with the strategies around um, managing their sleep and it might be really important. But then we think about the effects that that might start out as quite good intentions and quite benign, but then the effects that has on a long-term intimacy impact as well are really important. So it's so good to be here today. Um, so I'd like to just start off by saying that I'd want to acknowledge that not everyone's sexual experience is a positive. We are going to have a bit of fun here today, hopefully, and hopefully there's things that make you laugh and have a bit of a smile, but I would like to acknowledge that and we'll be sensitive in, um, in terms of how we talk about sex and sexual health. So in terms of having a bit of fun, I'd like you all to get your phones out to begin with, and I'd like you to go into Google, and can you Google slido.com? And I'm just going to get this set up on here. <coughs> So you're going to go to slido.com and you're going to enter the code C639. And what I'd like you to do then, it should come up with what word comes to mind when you think of sex. If you feel like the technology is too much, you can just yell it out if you'd rather. But what word, just, just think of any word that comes to mind. And if you put it into that, that website, it will send it through to the screen. Joy. Oh, that's a lovely one to start with. <laughs> Fun and relationships and love. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Intimacy, joining. Naked pleasure. So good. Connected, closeness, essential. That's a really nice one, isn't it? Because so often we think about sex as only belonging and sex and intimacy only belonging to the people that the media says that can have it. You know, beautiful young people. That's what we see on movies. But we're actually all sexual beings. Natural bonding. Tiring? Tiring. That's a really good one. I'm really glad someone put that in there, especially since we're talking about fact fatigue and activities. Closeness and connection, expression, intimate. So we can see there is, there's so much to sexuality. And I'm going to pause it there. Thank you. That was just because we could have play with that for quite a while. But we'll come back to that at the end, I think. Ah, uh, sorry. I think it's really important when we start out thinking about sex and intimacy that we, we really think about sex and sexuality. So sex is the activity. It's what we do. It's the, the ways in which we're physically intimate. But sexuality is so much more than that. It's, it's who we are. It's who we feel inside. It influences who we're attracted to, how we like to touch and be touched, how we like to spend physical closeness time with people. And our sexuality isn't something that ceases at a certain point. Although there's sometimes there's a lot of assumptions around sexuality and, and who is, you know, sometimes when we think of our parents having sex, a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to even think that happened. But there's no point in our life that we stop being sexual beings. Even if we've had a disability or an injury or we've gotten older, we're always a sexual being and how that's expressed might change over our lifespan. But it's really important that we honour that. And obviously sex has a really great function of making babies. And, you know, we all wouldn't be here if sex didn't exist. We're all the function of sexual intimacy. But it's really important that we step aside from that and realise it's not just about procreation. I think it's really it's really interesting how, how much easier it is to talk about fertility, to ask questions about fertility and hormones and, and think about how babies were made, than it is to talk about pleasure. And we'll have a little look at that. So thinking about the sex education that you had at school, can you put your hand up if you feel like you had a really good sex ed? 
Did anyone, did, <laughs> I can see some laughing, but... Yes, and there was nothing, yeah. And even now, thinking about sex ed in schools, a lot of sex is like this image here of how babies are made. You know, what are the sex organs and how does this happen? But do we really learn about pleasure? And do we really learn about intimacy and connection and, and our sexual response system? You know, we learn about our cardiovascular system, how our heart works, how our blood, our blood vessels work. Do we learn about how does our sexual response system work? What is it when we're turned on? What does that mean is going on in our body? Because we really know that that knowledge can be empowering. If we don't know how our body works, how does an erection happen? How does a clitoris become enlarged? What, what is pleasurable for somebody? then we don't know how it can be impacted by illnesses and injuries, and especially cancer treatment. What is the cancer treatment doing to that part of our body? And then how are those side effects happening? So we really know that knowledge can be empowering. And one of the tips from the Cancer Council is they really encourage people to gather as many facts as they can about the effects of their illness and its treatments on your sexuality. But look, you know, you're faced with a cancer diagnosis, you're gathering as many facts as you can about everything. So that's a huge ask. So I'd like to actually now, can you put your hands up if you've had a conversation with a healthcare professional about sex? Three, three, four, five, fantastic. Okay, five people, keep your hands in the air, nice and big. Everyone else, give them a round of applause. I feel like this is, <laughs> this is fantastic. But can you please keep your hands up if you raised the topic? Did anybody, <gasps> fantastic. So good. I think these people particularly need a huge round of applause because that is like actually raising the topic. There are so many barriers to talking about sex. We're really in our culture. We're really socialised not to talk about sex. Think about when you go to a dinner party. What do you don't talk about? We don't talk about sex. We don't talk about how much people earn. We try not to avoid politics and religion. Yeah. So it's in that, that thing that we're socialised not to have conversations about sex. So that applies to healthcare professionals as much as it applies to patients. So one of the big things in my role at the Austin is actually educating healthcare providers about it's okay to have conversations about sex and how to be able to do that in a way that lets people know they can talk about this without feeling, without feeling upset or um, potentially offended. There are so many barriers, aren't there? People are scared, they're feeling embarrassed, how do I talk about this? And especially in the context of cancer, there are so many other things to talk about from what I've heard from people who've had cancer is often they say, I didn't think it was important. You know, that they were trying to save my life. They're doing all these other things. This is down the list somewhere. But we actually know from those words that we put on the screen before, it's so important. It's a really integral part of who we are. And, and actually to, to just push that off to the side means that it's going to cause worries and it's going to cause concerns and it feeds into lack of sleep. And so it all is really interrelated. So there's often these questions that I get asked, well, well, who do I talk to? Like, I want to have a conversation with someone, but who can I talk to? And I would actually say, talk to the person that you feel most comfortable with. There is actually no, apart from my role, which is quite unique, I'm one of the few sexual health nurses in the state and in Australia that actually talk to people about sex and intimacy after cancer and after illnesses. So actually any health professional should be able to have a level of conversation with you. They'll ask you some questions about it, but they, they should be able to point you in the direction of somebody who can help. You might choose to talk to the dietitian if fatigue's a real problem and energy levels are a real problem. Actually talking to the dietitian about how you can improve your energy levels might be the person you go to. But it might also be you talk to the psychologist about it. It might be that you talk to the doctor and about the medications and the side effects. So really go with whoever you feel most comfortable with. How do you raise the topic? Oh, it's a, it's a tricky one. How do I bring that up in amongst everything else? Really just keep remembering that these side effects you're experiencing, they're just as important as any other side effect. And in the same way that you might say, look, I'm a little bit concerned, my vision's not been great these last few weeks or I've been feeling really tired. Yeah, say that. I'm a little bit worried. This has been going on. I've noticed this. I'm having a lot of trouble with my partner in terms of physical intimacy. Can I talk to you about that? Ideally, though, what I'd love to see is you don't have to raise the topic. I'd love it to be routine in the sense that health professionals include it in things that they talk through. And what sort of help or support will you get? Well, that, again, is going to depend on that person's experience, but I really hope that that person will be able to give you the advice from their point of view that what, uh, what they know, but also then help point you in the direction of other resources as well. 
because we know that cancer and its treatments can have a huge impact on sexuality. And I really like this image here of the heart within the tree, all of those medical things that are going on, but our intimacy and our sexuality are such an important part of who we are that we can't just leave that outside. It really is at the centre. We know that chemotherapy and radiotherapy and other medications, like we've heard from um, the, the doctor who spoke at the start of this session, can have such big impacts on our body. And our sexual response system, it's a really complex look. I'd love to have time to kind of go into the intricacies of that. But really, it involves nerves and blood vessels and hormones. And any of these things can be impacted by chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So it can really have quite a physical effect on our bodies. And other medications that we might be on, such as antidepressants, can also affect our, our willingness or our in, initiative to be sexual as well in terms of our libido. And then there's the psychological element, that body image change, those role changes. If you were somebody that had a certain role within your relationship and within your family life, and that's all changed now. How do you feel about yourself? How do you feel about your gender and your sexuality? How do you feel about your relationship? You know, we know that actually responsibility and desire butt heads. Esther Perel, she's a famous um, sexologist. She says that responsibility and desire butt heads. And so when we're some, in a relationship where one person has taken on more of a caring role, it's really hard sometimes to fall into a caring role and then back into an intimate partner role, especially if that's not being spoken about. And so after cancer treatment, <clears throat> there are many common sexual problems. These are just a few of them. It might be a loss of sexual interest or desire. There can be pain. Pain can be a really big one, pain and fatigue. A loss of fertility, erectile dysfunction through that damage to blood vessels and, and nerves. Vaginal dryness can be a huge one that really impacts on people's ability to be intimate afterwards. And think about immune system suppression. Uh, people who've had genital warts or herpes in the past, that might have been something that their immune system has been able to conquer and get over. But over, during cancer treatment, if that immune system has been damaged, then those uh, STIs that have been there before can flare up. Both of these are kind of more like the common colds of the genitals. They're not hugely dangerous, but they are really inconvenient and can be really distressing for people. So all of these problems kind of lead often to a reduced sexual frequency and satisfaction. And that can play into how people feel about themselves as well. So I'm just going to read out now. This is Susan's story um, that was for, uh, taken from a website in the UK. Susan says, I was 44 when I was diagnosed with lymphoma. And it's difficult, actually, because when you're going through chemotherapy, you feel your partner is suffering quite a lot and you're desperate to get back to some kind of normality. One of the things the chemo did was took away my natural lubrication. That was awful because I was desperate to pretend I was normal, even when I wasn't 100%. Sex was a nightmare. I'd never heard of KY Jelly. I was of the old school where you didn't talk about sex. You didn't discuss it, and even with your best friend, actually. And so you suffered this kind of thing. I wanted to discuss these things with my husband at the time. I was trying, but I couldn't. I felt he'd suffered long enough. And I didn't ask anybody if it was really going to continue forever. I really didn't know if this was me for the rest of my life. And that's scary. And then all of a sudden, when I was in the company of a nurse friend, I think I hinted at something and she just came out and said, buy a lubricant. And that was incredible and changed my life. And sometimes it's really simple things, but you can think of the amount of time and, and energy and, and worry that's caused this person from not being able to talk about it. And something else Susan said about, you know, just wanting to go back to normal. That's something that I've heard many times of for people when they've gone through cancer treatment thinking that I'm going to get through this and on the other side of it, well, sex is just going to go back to normal at some point. But you can see from everything that's happened and thinking about those, those late effects as well that your body has inherently changed and things have been influenced, things have been impacted by this big thing that's happened and that impacts on the relationship as well. So there is going to be, there will be a new normal in a sense. It's not going to be going back to what it was, but it's finding out what that new normal is. And I'd like to just share now a little video um, of Graham, who's talking about the experience that he had. My name's Graham Bauer. I'm 42. Uh, my partner is Martin, and we've been together for 12 years. I was diagnosed with a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma with mycosis fungoides, which is a kind of skin cancer. It's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Martin and I had always been very close. We've always been like best friends. So I guess when I was diagnosed with cancer, then that had a huge impact on, on both of us. When I was on chemotherapy, 
uh, I was quite unwell for a lot of the time. Um, I had allergic reactions to some of my medication. I had some serious infections. And so feeling unwell like that, I think it's natural that you're not so interested in, in sex. Um, and I wasn't. Um, and to be honest, Martin and I didn't really even think about that much. It's not the first thing that's on your mind necessarily when you're going through that kind of experience. And um, whilst, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important, um, our relationship is about so much more than that. The problems with my skin had an impact on my confidence. Um, friends would say things like, you know, it looked like I had an alien skin. And I knew that they were joking, um, but those things, they, they sort of affect you inside, affect your, your confidence. Before cancer, I was very unfit, unhealthy, overweight, and to just have skin that was perpetually flaking everywhere um, really did not make me feel very confident about my appearance at all. The problems with my skin didn't affect my relationship in the sense that um, he never made me feel bad about, about them at all, never. Um, they didn't seem to bother him as much as they bothered me. I do think one thing that everyone needs to consider when they're going through chemotherapy is fertility and sperm banks. Um, even if you're not at a stage in your life when you're necessarily thinking about having a family, um, you know, it might be that that's the time in which you, you need to make a decision. Um, and I, I think a lot of people might assume that it's less important to gay people. Um, but it obviously is just as important to anyone that, that wants to have a family. Um, so I, I think most hospitals will, will talk to patients about this. Um, but I, I guess I would encourage any gay friends that were about to go through chemotherapy to think about that. A lot of things changed as a result of the cancer. Um, but I think one of the most important ones is that I, I really feel it brought us together in, in a different way, that the friendship became even closer. see when we're thinking about sexuality and cancer, particularly working in the area that I do, is there's often a lot of negative fears and beliefs that people have. Um, and until they actually take time to talk about those, those can kind of build up and be, can cause a lot of pressure. Those thoughts of, I'm not desirable anymore. And what if I can't satisfy my partner? What if it doesn't work? What if it hurts? I don't feel like a real man or a real woman anymore. What if they reject me? And all of these negative feelings, they, they make sense and they can often be accompanied by these emotions of sadness and guilt and grief and anger. You know, sadness at what's been lost and guilt about, you know, when we think back to uh, Susan's story before when she was saying about, I felt like my partner had suffered enough and I really wanted to be able to do this thing for my partner now. So often there can be that guilt. And, and anger about what's been taken away from you. Like, this is another thing that you've then got to deal with. So all of these emotions kind of, you can see why they fuel those negative thoughts. But unfortunately, those negative thoughts and emotions, they tend to lead to avoidance. And that's often what we see is that people will, they will step away from physical intimacy and sexuality rather than towards it because it's a little bit too hard basket, like for all of those reasons. And what avoidance does, it's avoidance is really good at then perpetuating those ideas of, I'm not desirable, this is not gonna happen anymore. And on top of that, the partner who's on the other side of it can feel feelings of rejection as well. And one of the other things that um, we see, particularly if people have had quite intense cancer journeys with lots of medications and radiotherapy is that the partner has not only become more of the carer in that role, but has also been really worried about causing pain or inflicting those extra needs onto that person in some way. So often people won't reach out for physical connection because they're, they're scared of that meaning or that the meaning then being that they want something from that person physically. So there ends up being this avoidance and this distance. And then if you couple that with people who've chosen to now move into separate bedrooms because of sleeping challenges, then it sort of drives a wedge that's really quite, it's, it's quite hard to then re-establish physical intimacy after that. And it's definitely not impossible, but it's something that can happen. 
So there's this really this idea that there needs to be grieving for the old life, but also starting a new one. And actually, the best way to do that is through communication with, with a partner. A lot of people will come and see me and, and talk about their, their issues or their concerns that are going on with sex. But one of the things they say is, I just don't know how to have that conversation with my partner. It feels really hard. So here's some tips that I've put together. Choose a place and time of day. Really not in bed is really important. So time of, like thinking about, we're talking about fatigue before, what's a time of day that feels good? And sometimes giving someone a heads up to say, hey, I'd love to have a chat with you about intimacy um, and sex, sex, sex stuff, whatever you want to say it, but how could we do this? Could we go for a walk? Do you want to go down to the beach and sit by the ocean? Do you want to go for, um, go for a coffee somewhere, maybe with kind of a, a private area? <laughs> um, but definitely not in bed because often in bed is the time when there's lots of feelings and pressure around that. Acknowledging that cancer can put a strain on even the healthiest of relationships. I think, you know, your relationship survived this far and actually uh, acknowledging that it has put that strain on it because I think sometimes when we bring up sex with a partner, it can be really challenging for the partner in terms of them thinking, oh gosh, there's a, there's a problem here. So really being open about how you feel, sharing your fears and being open to hearing how your partner feels. What are they scared of? And talk about what sex and intimacy means in your relationship. You know, for people that have said to me, you know, previously we were sexually active and we can't now for whatever reason. Well, what did, what did sex, what role did sex and intimacy play in your relationship? And what are other things that you are doing in your relationship and that you can spend more time doing to sort of fill those gaps and help build up that intimacy again? And what is important to each of you? Really kind of taking it away from the physical act of how are we going to do this and going, well, what's really important to me right now? At different stages of, of cancer and treatment and afterwards, there might be times when actually physical closeness and being able to hug someone and hold someone is so important. And you want to make sure that maybe that's, that's what you want at the moment and not more than that. And actually having a conversation about that gives people a freedom to enjoy that without that worry that they're sending a message non-verbally that might be picked up in a different way. And what activities make you feel connected? So think about outside of the bedroom. What are the other things that you're doing in life that, you know, when you go out and you're holding hands or you're going to the movies together or spending time with friends, what are those things that make you feel connected? And what activities feel pleasurable? The really important thing about uh, thinking about returning to sex after cancer is that maybe it's about following what feels good. Sometimes it's really nice to have someone play with your hair or stroke your back. And actually, if that's the thing that feels good, can, can you have a discussion about asking for that thing instead of thinking that it needs to be a certain thing? So really, we want to encourage people to really broaden that idea of sex. You know, I think sometimes, especially if we've had a partner that we've been together with for many, many years, there can be an idea that there's almost like a sexual script that develops. I do this, you do this, then this happens, then this happens, then we go to sleep. And there's this kind of order of things and it becomes the natural order of things. But really thinking, well, what else is there that we might like to do together? Given that this, is, this thing's challenging at the moment, what else can we be part of? And the Cancer Council have a tip saying try to keep an open mind about the ways to feel sexual pleasure. And this is like really thinking the two of you together about what are the brakes and what are the accelerators. I really like this as an image because it kind of helps you a bit like when you're keeping a sleep diary or you're documenting your fatigue, thinking about what are the things that make me feel more up for being intimate with my partner and what are the things that really make me not. For example, having low fatigue might be something that makes me go, no, nah, I don't want that. Um, I was speaking to a woman the other day. She said, oh, watching my husband with the vacuum cleaner. I love that. <laughs> so it might be something really, really silly and simple. But, you know, it's actually looking at what are the, what are the things that, that make, make this potential feel more fun and what are the things that make it feel hard. There might be so many breaks going on at the moment. There might be, it might be like dealing with all of these extra symptoms after cancer as well that actually put the brakes on. And maybe it's actually acknowledging, do you know what? doesn't matter how much you press that accelerator pedal at the moment, the foot's flat to the floor with the brakes, so nothing's going to happen. And actually acknowledging that's what's happening. So when we're talking about resuming sex, because for a lot of people it is put on the back burner while cancer treatment's happening, really there's this idea of mutual readiness. It's a kind of a conversation that's happened around, okay, well, how do we feel about this? Are we both up for it? And rediscovering those small acts of intimacy and other sensual activities. Sex is a very natural function. It's a very sensual function. It's about getting in touch with your, your body sensations. Other sensual activities might be going for a walk and listening to the sounds 
that are out in the in the in the neighborhood uh, they might be laying on the grass and looking at the sky and actually feeling the feel of the grass on your body it might be going for a swim and actually feeling the feel of water on your body the more you can get in touch with how you're connecting physically with the environment the more it kind of sets up well for sexual intimacy as well and really focusing on the journey, not the destination, taking away the idea that sex needs to get somewhere and can be more about us enjoying pleasure together. Reducing distractions, kids, worries, needing to get up in the morning, all of those things make intimacy really hard. So it does become a lot like fatigue and planning. And redefining sex and following that pleasure. And really going slowly, listening to your body and taking your time. And just going to cover a few specific things, though, that often I hear of people being concerned about after cancer treatment. One of them is that vaginal dryness or pain. It's really important that if anyone's ever suffering from vaginal dryness and pain, especially with penetrative intercourse, not to push through that pain. Pushing through that pain and thinking it'll get better, it's fine, I can tolerate it, sometimes can set up a bit of a cycle where your body almost anticipates that pain next time and there can be something happen where the pelvic floor muscles will contract and it gets more and more painful each time. So really not pushing through. The vaginal dryness can be really difficult for people, especially if people have been pushed into early menopause. That can be quite a sudden change. And so thinking about moisturisers in the same way that if our skin's dry and we moisturise our face, there are vaginal moisturisers as well. And there's really, really great lubricants out there. This one, Pure, is actually, they have a very sensitive lubricant that's designed for people who've been through cancer treatments. The most important thing if anyone's ever choosing a lubricant is to try and pick a lubricant that's as natural as possible in terms of not containing artificial colours and flavours. Often if we have flavours in a lubricant, there can be sugars in there as well, and that can increase the risk of thrush. So really thinking about maybe an organic lubricant. Lubricants can come in a water-based form um, or a silicon-based form. And silicon's really great because it actually lasts a bit longer. The water will be absorbed and you might need to reapply. The silicon is much more likely to be very, very comfortable. But the important thing is you can't use silicon with a silicon sex toy as well because they sort of, they uh, aggravate each other. And in terms of erectile dysfunction, there are many things that can be done to help improve erections because erections can definitely be impacted by cancer treatment. One of them is Viagra that can help enhance erections and that's something you need to talk to the GP about. There are vacuum pumps that can be used to, um, to actually pull blood into the penis and then a ring is put at the base of the penis to keep the blood in the penis. The erection from a vacuum pump can be quite, it can feel different to an erection that's happened um, without a pump and it can actually feel a bit cooler. But a lot of people, sorry, was it? It's vacuuming. It's vacuuming, yeah, it's actually. <laughs> Um, but for a lot of people, like people who've had quite bad nerve damage, especially after particular types of radiotherapy, the vacuum pump can definitely work in a way that Viagra can't. And then there's injections. A lot of people will wince at the thought of injecting anything um, into their penis, but for some people that's the, that's the way that they choose to go. The injections do work really well, but again, a conversation to have with the healthcare provider. Um, way, way down the list of interventions, but just so you know about it, there are actually prostheses that can be put in so people can have an erection if they've had complete erectile dysfunction, and that's a surgical intervention. And actually, for a lot of people suffering erectile dysfunction, um, a lot of that can be in, like, increased and improved by having good psychological help as well. So talking to someone about what's going on, understanding the mechanisms of erections, and actually looking at the things that are influencing on that erectile function. And I just want to mention as well that vibration is something that is, when we've talked before about increasing the idea of what sex is, vibration is something that is pleasurable to both, both genders of people, so people with penises and people with vaginas as well. So you can see this, this black tubular one and the kind of like U-shaped one are good vibrators for penises and then there are more clitoral type vibrators for people with vaginas as well. The reason why I mentioned vibration is after after sex is, uh, sorry after cancer has happened, sex can be a very fatiguing activity, and especially trying to to get to the level of arousal that might have an orgasm that's really lovely, and then there's a great amount of endorphins and good sleep that happens afterwards. Vibration can be a really almost like a fast track mechanism to that, and it can really reduce the amount of effort required as well. So thinking outside the box sometimes can be really good. So in terms of resources and referrals, your healthcare team are a really good place to start. Um, the Cancer Council helpline are fantastic. The nurses there have been trained as well in talking about sex and intimacy. And talking to your GP about things can be great as well. That booklet that I've put up there, Sexuality, Intimacy and Cancer, is a really good kind of one-stop shop that has lots of information on this topic. 
Relationships Australia can be a good place to start if you look at getting some relationship counselling. Um, or maybe you'd like to go and talk to someone specifically about sex with your partner and a sexologist can be a good place to go. We also do have the sexual health service that I work for at the Austin. We're a really little service. I work one day a week and my colleague works one day a week, but we are actually happy to take referrals outside of Austin as well. Um, so there's an email address there, sexualhealth.service at austin.org.au. You can email this and self-refer and come and talk to someone at our service about what's been going on. And that's a free public health service. So finally, look, I think that there is so much that we can learn from experience and learning from other people. And I wondered if, can you go open up your phones again? And if you've got something that you've learned or a tip or a piece of advice that if you could give to everyone else in this room about sex, then what we're going to do is put that up on the screen and it might be really, hang on, I'll just go to the next one. So maybe if people have got questions, I'm happy to take questions now, but also... If you've got some advice for other people here, something that, just a, a word or something that you wanted to share, then this is, this is a, a time when you could share that. And while that's happening, are there any questions? Okay, yes. Oh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> I don't mind breaking the ice. Mm. I, I have two incurable blood cancers mm -hmm. and I was diagnosed nine years ago so I've had a lot of experience in diagnosis and so forth but the thing is when you're diagnosed it almost feels as though as a patient you become the psychologist for everyone around you and I feel that we have to go back before your talk and actually the pa it's not the patient everyone around you has to come to understand cancer and you're the person giving them the information. Yeah. Now, that I think is also a factor on intimacy. Are you going to die in a month? Are you going to die? The financial things all create a strain that has to become understood. Ros has had cancer as well, so we're both in the same sort of situation, but I feel that situation of the patient becoming the psychologist for everyone around them, probably including their patient, their partner, is a huge thing in this. It's huge, isn't it? And that responsibility that comes with that and, and having those conversations, yeah. And I, think, and I think that's sometimes where it can be really helpful for you with your partner to actually outsource that. And to go to someone where you're like, okay, we'd like to talk about this, well, but can we have... Fine, but I think that that pressure on everyone, the people who are diagnosed with cancer, yeah. they become the psychologist for their whole social set around them. Yeah. The people around them, they, they make some ridiculous thing about cancer, some comment, oh, my friend had that, and they were on such and such. Yeah, they, yeah. Completely ridiculous statements and you actually have to re-educate probably a partner, probably your whole friendship. Yeah. If you, in fact, have a mature opinion about, their ca about another person's cancer. Yeah, and I think that says a lot about society and the education that we get and, yeah, people's general levels of awareness. But, yeah, thank you for sharing. It's, it's a, yeah, a really tough thing. It's definitely a topic that, yeah, people don't feel comfortable talking about, that's yeah. for sure, yeah, including health professionals. Um, any other questions? Oh, yep. And thank you for all of these. I've just been watching them flick up over the screen and hopefully there's a few things there that you can <laughs> use as a takeaway message. Uh, mine's more a comment than uh, a question. Um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, see Simone a couple of times and... Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, helped my relationship with uh, with my wife, and uh, and it was part of my uh, when after I was uh, finished my trial drug uh, when I uh, I was obviously at the ONJ. Um, as part of the survivorship program, was actually setting up the uh, as part of that was the uh, was the dealings with Simone, and so I'd encourage uh, everybody to uh, if if it's an issue. And if it's even if it's not, uh, the discussions that we had took a lot of pressure and stress off myself 
which made our relationship better. So a big thank you to her and I'd recommend it to anybody to uh, to uh, to consider it because uh, it's damned important. Yeah, no, thank you for that. It's great advice and I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you do take referrals from elsewhere as well. I'm sure for those interstate people, there'll be local ones there and I can try and put you in touch. Yeah, and we can actually do phone appointments as well. Oh, phone? Yeah. Excellent. So, Brilliant. Yeah. No, it's um, definitely, I think it's... Something that most um, couples could probably do with is some sort of counselling to, to get their life back on track a little bit as well and it doesn't hurt, that's for sure. Is there any other questions? Got a couple minutes. No? All good. Nick, we can definitely email us and um, if there's any other questions that we've missed or topics or anything like that. So thank you, Simone. That's and thank fantastic. you all for participating in that. Thank you. Thank you for your, um, everyone's participation as well. Fantastic.